The land speeder. The speeder of land. Or overland. The miniature in question is a cumbersome bulk of metal. In this video, I'll show you how I built and painted mine as an essential addition to the Ultramarines army of my dreams. Not many people know this, but the land speeder in the 40k lore was named such because the STC data was discovered by the famous techno-archaeologist Arkan Speed. I think that was his name. I'll double check and get back to you. If you've been following my hobby projects for a while, you'll know that last year I achieved a major hobby life goal, collecting and painting an Ultramarines army for 2nd edition Warhammer 40k. I say achieved, as if the goal was completely done and dusted, but there are, or rather were, a few models I still wanted to add to my collection, and for a long time, the land speeder was top of my wish list. At this stage, I would love to share a childhood story with you, of a small Matthew, staring longingly through the window of Games Workshop, face pressed against the glass, smashing his piggy bank to see if he could afford such a model. But no, 12 year old me wasn't bothered about a speeder of land, only tanks, which is where my pocket money was spent. No, this need for speed, or a massive chunk of metal, was born from more recent readings of retro literature, namely Codex Ultramarines. Just have a look at this beautiful picture of the land speeder about to cook some snake bite orcs for breakfast. Or this land speeder escorting a razorback and rhino through some alpine countryside. Or this one posing with a tech marine. And the rest of this magnificent force. Or this one bringing up the rear of some assault marines. Stepping back for a moment, these pictures are no doubt all of the same studio model. Codex Angels of Death shows an equally stunning land speeder, painted in the colours and heraldry of the Blood Angels, which appears again at the back of the Codex, in a situation I find oddly amusing. Now I can't recall the rules for the Lictor, but I wouldn't say this is the best position for the land speeder. I guess it depends on who had the next turn. So this particular model was released in 1994, going by the engravings on some of the metal parts. The second edition version of the miniature was most likely entirely metal, save for the flight stand and the plastic arm, shoulder pad and bolt pistol for the pilot. 17 metal parts shown here. This page is in the back of the Ultramarines Codex, which is the same type of page you would find in Citadel catalogues and the back of White Dwarf magazines from the time. There's also very helpful assembly instructions, which we'll return to later. After raising all the necessary funds for an eBay purchase, the model was mine. Although with regular price rises for plastic kits being what they are, had I purchased the plastic land speeder kit brand new, which hasn't been discontinued for very long, I probably wouldn't have paid too much less. The model arrived with a less than perfect flight stand. And the model was caked in paint, so I stripped it with BioStrip, and this yielded these metal components, which required some cleanup cleaning off mould lines with the edge of my hobby knife, filing down some more difficult lines with my file, cutting off some little nubs from the casting process, and removing these, what I like to call, wormies, also a symptom of the casting process. And what's this strange oozing puss ball in the flight stand socket? Ah, just some epoxy glue. At least, I hope that's what it is. With the parts cleaned up, it was time for assembly. The instructions from the Codex recommend you start with the engine pod, so who was I to question them? Before applying superglue, I sanded down the surfaces with my file to increase the surface area, and therefore the strength of the bond formed. Next, I slotted the pod between the main chassis, taking advantage of the malleability of the metal, which actually held the pod in place even before superglue was applied. Then, the stabilizer fin was attached, Again, bending this a little for grip. Comments on my Instagram commonly lauded the use of pinning with this model, and I was prepared to do that. But I felt that for the most part, there were enough points of contact that this was not necessary. 
I chose to install the seats next. I worried briefly that there was a left and right seat, but no. Both are the same, so that was fine. However, this added an issue that they wouldn't sit flush side by side with the detail protruding as it does. So sadly, I had to remove said detail from one seat to make it fit, which of course gave me anxiety tearing up a treasured relic such as this. In this case, I decided I did want some pinning. I attached the back seat rests first, and then glued the seat in place with a pin holding it in the chassis. The softness of this metal meant drilling was easier than expected. And before the glue set, I dusted on some baking soda to give a stronger bond. On go the engine nozzles, which have a significant nub on each one to hold them in place. Before I glued on the footrest, which was also the housing for the flight stand, I wanted to play around with the idea that I had to make a better flight stand than the original. The instructions say you can chop off the pin at the top, so that helps since this was always the bit that would come away on jet bikes and the like. But the issue was the tiny footprint of the hexagonal stand. I instead opted for a 60mm transparent base that was issued with later plastic land speeders. However, I didn't have much faith in that to support 233 grams of old land speeder. So I had this crazy idea that the wood from a paintbrush would work. And would you believe it? I had one that fit the hole like a bolt round in an orc's eye socket. Drilling the remnants of plastic stand from the hole in the base first, I proceeded to chop the paintbrush to size and then carve away the excess from one side so it slotted into the base. I glued it with super glue, and when that had set, spread some milliput around for extra stability. With that out of the way, I bent and glued the footrest into place, and with a spot for their feet, I could work on the crew, which really only entailed pinning and gluing the boat pistol arm onto the pilot. I pinned the flamer, I mean the heavy flamer, onto the right fairing, and put this to one side, since I planned to paint this as a sub-assembly which means some parts would need a painting handle. And now, trigger warning time. One of the most surreal things I have done in the hobby, drilling into the tender area for this marine, in order to pin him to the flight stand. I can only apologise for the painful image this has left you with. Anyway, this allowed me to pin him to a 25mm base, and you can see here, the pin was inserted into the hole in the marine and bent around the base, so it was flush with the bottom. Then, secured with plenty super glue and baking soda. When that was all dry, it was blue tacked onto the paint handle. I repeated this on his mate, and so here we are. I used another paintbrush as a stick to hold the land speeder with, since I wanted to reduce the wear on the actual base. There's actually not much information at all in the Codex Ultramarines about land speeders. Apart from the lovely photographs, icons and badges, all it says about land speeders is that they are crewed by assault marines, either whilst their jump packs are in maintenance, or if they fancy some joyriding with the boys. The army list section merely states that land speeders are two-man fast attack vehicles powered by gravitic reaction motors, and capable of carrying a variety of weaponry, which doesn't align with the information on the data facts since that only mentions the multi-melter and heavy flamer. Sure, Ravenwing land speeders were equipped with heavy bolters and the assault cannon, but this was only available to the Dark Angels and their successors in this edition. It was third edition where the heavy weapons became more mix and match, and even then, that was only for the so-called land speeder tornado. Anyway, we're not fooling around with those silly Dark Angels. So, Multi-melter and heavy flamer it is. It is noteworthy that the crew of the land speeder are able to take special and assault weapons, meaning they could have flamers, melter guns, plasma guns, and bolters if desired. Or even pistols, power fists, and the like. Which makes sense, given that they are assault marines, outsourced to flying a jet-powered easy chair. I suppose in the event of the land speeder crashing and not exploding, they can get out and harass the enemy as a two-man squad, armed with some nifty weapons. Then again, you would need models to represent these, 
but it's a fun idea nevertheless. In order to take a land speeder, one needed to pay 145 points and take a tech marine. This tax was necessary any time a player wanted to take any space marine support gun or vehicle. The land speeder is not a particularly well armoured vehicle, so if a hit is scored, it's quite likely going to do something. Landing a hit is the more tricky part, since the hit modifiers were common and cumulative. Shooting at a vehicle that moves 10 to 20 inches conferred a minus 1 to hit modifier, and an additional minus 2 if the vehicle moved more than 20 inches. So even a space marine with ballistic skill 4 would be hitting a fast moving skimmer on a roll of a 6. If a hit is scored and the armour is penetrated, the shot could hit the vehicle or crew. Datafax cards had loads of fluffy information as to the result of a penetrating hit. For example, if the pilot is killed, then the land speeder will be deemed out of control. And yes, detailed rules existed to govern this eventuality. A roll of a six on this table if the vehicle is hit results in this colourful demise for the doomed land speeder. The land speeder's fuel explodes, killing the crew. The flaming wreck crashes to the ground 2d6 inches away in a random direction. When the wreck hits the ground, its ammunition explodes, causing D3 strength 8 hits with a minus 3 save roll modifier on all models within 3 inches. And yes, my friends and I would take great pleasure reading aloud the demise of a vehicle, with a special smugness reserved for that moment. After a black prime, it was time for some blue paint. Now I toyed with the prime colour for a time, white or black. White would no doubt have increased the vibrancy of the blue on top, but I was more concerned with the fact that the model has so much detail that I might miss a spot, and if I did, then I wanted it to be black rather than white, since black hides mistakes better in my opinion. So black it was. McCrack blue was the base colour of choice, being a particularly dark blue by second edition standards. This would be a shade colour for the base layer, and again, would be useful to be visible in the recesses, so this went all over every component, leaving some areas black if there were going to be any other colour. I suppose at this stage I could have painted two layers of my actual base colour until I had sufficient coverage, but I like to build up layers through darker colours when using a black prime, again if for no other reason that I can layer some shading, which I prefer to washing for the most part. And here's how the speeder looks at this stage. Now I chose gun metal to dry brush over the seats. Not much of these will be visible later on, but some might be, so I didn't just want them to be black. I also applied this colour to the underside, where all the cables and rivets were, as well as the engine nozzles, and the detail on the upper side of the engine pod. I'm using Vallejo Flat Blue for the base. With my other Ultramarines, I use Calador Sky, by Citadel, but I fancied a change, and the colours are very similar anyway. I basically painted this everywhere there was McCrack Blue, nothing fancy here, just a couple of thin down layers. Though on each fin there was a line which I tried to avoid, since I wanted it to be black, but if I went over the line accidentally, I later came back with my thinnest brush and applied the thin black line to correct it. I'm following the scheme in the codex colour pages, more or less. So the multi-melter is also mostly blue. On the crew, I left the shoulder pad trims black. These will be yellow later, but a black line between blue and yellow will allow for some nice sharp definition. Similarly, I left the black showing between the fingers and between the armour plates on the head. I didn't want to have to mess about with washes later if I could avoid it. Sidel Lotham Blue was the highlight colour, and I felt the wet palette could do with a refresh before I go any further. Normally, I do a few highlights to get a bit of a gradient going, but this time I wanted them to be as sharp as I could manage, so I took my time to paint a thin line at the edge of every armour panel with thin Lotham Blue. And yes, mistakes were made. And yes, this was painstaking. But I want to continue to practice my edge highlighting, and so this seemed a good opportunity. Some edges can be highlighted by dragging the brush at 90 degrees to the edge, but this tends to work better when the edges themselves are at 90 degrees. The other edges, with shallower angles, 
I painted by drawing a thin line down the edge. I find moving my hand in the downward direction when painting makes mistakes less likely. I even highlighted the underside of the land speeder, but I was a bit rougher with this. In fact, I am a sucker for painting details no one will see, hence the subassembly. Silly, I know, but here we are. I'm sure I'm not the only one who does that. And here's the speeder and crew after the highlighting stage. I have missed some details on the legs of the crew, but these won't be seen at all, once the model is fully assembled. I wasn't quite done yet with the highlighting. To increase the poppage, I used a mix of loth and blue and white, and I dot the corner of the armour in various places with this. Sometimes it's more of a line than a dot, but it completes the look in my opinion. Finally, in some areas, I painted two thin lines of blue, as if the armour had been scratched. I'm turning my attention here to the seats, which are black. I use a light grey to highlight the edges of these, and everything else that would be black. The mixture here for grey I made myself, with black, white, and a little blue. I used this same mixture to paint the ridges on the tubes on the crew, and on the weapons as well. And let's not forget these seat belts, which also were highlighted, which is important, since sections 99 through 102 of the UK Highway Code stipulate that seat belts must be worn while driving or riding in a vehicle, if seat belts are fitted. Land speeders, of course, are skimmers, which opens up for them the possibility of pop-up attacks, which was my least favourite rule in second edition, mainly because my friend with his Eldar army loved to pop up his Falcon Graf tank at the back end of the map and snipe by Space Marines all game long. This rule allowed them to hide behind a hill, a building or other terrain piece, then instead of moving horizontally, they could move 12 inches vertically, shoot, and pop back down at the end of the shooting phase. Of course, they could be targeted by overwatch fire, but 12 inches needed to be added to the range. This, of course, would lead to a potentially amusing game of whack-a-mole between skimmer and opponents on overwatch. Although revisiting these rules rejuvenated my childhood PTSD, the silver lining is that I discovered this rule which states that skimmers may change their altitude by any amount. So now, I have the idea of taking a step ladder to my next second edition game, and mounting the land speeder on some contraption over it, to represent the dizzying altitude. The only ceiling being one governed by the feasibility of engineering. On the side of the seats are these panels with a few details. The box at the top left was black, the wires painted red, and the rivets gun metal. I highlighted the black just like the seats, and for the red, they were first murkite red, and next this phileo red I often use, dark vermilion. The murkite red, which is this old but still usable foundation paint, was applied to all the areas that were red on the reference pictures I was using, most of which was the heavy flamer and these fuel canisters. And once this was dry, every red part got a coat of dark vermilion. I even painted the cables and other details underneath, for reasons I explained earlier. And here's the model and its components thus far. You can see I also painted the nose on the speed of gun metal, and the bolt pistol was also red, like ultramarine weapons often are from this era. Dark sand is now applied to all areas that will be yellow. For instance, the shoulder pad trims on the crew. I do my best to leave black showing in the recesses for that sharp transition I was talking about earlier. The model shows a little bit of the chest quiller. This also got dark sand. And the skull too, even though it will not be yellow. This is a fantastic bone paint. Exceptional coverage and a staple of my arsenal. Of course, it also needed to be applied to the heavy flamer muzzle, and on the multi-melter too. There were many trims around the engine pod and fins on the land speeder. These also got dark sand. And it's looking like this so far. Many yellow paints go terribly over the other colours, so a white or beige base is an essential step. Citadel Contrast Imperial Fist is the yellow I'm using here. I haven't tried this yet, 
and I was eager to see the results. It went on, buttery smooth, and gave the vibrancy I was hoping for. So I would call that a successful test, and I'm looking forward to painting some yellow space marines with it in the future. The only drawback was sometimes I had to go back and redo the dark sand step if it was patchy. Contrast yellow, where black or blue is showing, makes it look green, which is of course far from ideal. With that dry, I moved on to highlighting the red, which, if you've watched my previous videos, you'll know I prefer to do with Barbarian Flesh from Army Painter. I use this with a drop of orange to highlight whatever this is near the nose, as well as any pipes I painted red around the edges of the fuel canisters and on the pertinent sections of the bolt pistol and heavy flamer. The Land Speeder is so named for... Hang on. No. It was Land. Ark and Land, not Ark and Speed. I'm always getting those two confused. Anyway, in the lore, the famous techno-archaeologist Ark and Land discovered the STC data used to manufacture the Land Speeder, as well as the Land Rager, of course. As is typical of the 40k universe, not many people know how the thing works. The anti-gravitic plates which give the land speeder its ability to fly remain a mystery, restricted mostly to the Techno-Magos of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Though not able to achieve high altitudes, they can be deployed from Thunderhawks as part of a rapid assault, which is neat. Such speed is achieved by having flimsy armour. Indeed, power armour of the Space Marine pilots probably affords more protection. At least high velocity and manoeuvrability helps them dodge enemy fire, in the lore at least. I was at the stage where I wanted to glue in the crew since all the details on the speeder were done that would otherwise be blocked. So to finish the crew, I needed decals. I started with a thin coat of Ardco gloss varnish, then I used Microset and Microsol during the application of the transfer. Another Ard coat and matte varnish spray finished that step. The left shoulder as the Ultramarine chapter icon, while the right has the Assault Squad badge, since apparently Assault Marines earn overtime pay flying land speeders. I hear it's double time on bank holidays. I mix some light grey in my palette with a large blob of white and just a touch of black. I use this to paint the wings on the chest of the crew, and on the wings on the fairings. The armour, that is, not Cornish fairings, which are a delicious biscuit by the way. The eye lens was black at this stage. I added a small oval of white to the centre of the lens, leaving it black around the outside. And while this white was on my brush, I painted the wings on the fairings white, leaving grey showing in the recesses. This step was repeated on the wings on the crew also. There were some other details on the fairings I wanted to do at this stage, such as the buttons on the heavy flamer, which I painted white first to take the following colours better which were a mix of yellow, green and red. I wonder how many settings the flamer needs. Toast? Gently lick? Incinerate? Maybe it's like the power in a microwave, where you have it on a lower setting for a bowl of soup rather than a full chicken. Anyway, the rivets are silver in the reference picture, so I painted these with gunmetal. Back to the crew. I painted their eye lenses with bar red contrast. The white and black undercoat means the lens looks brighter in the middle, which was my intent. The last detail on the fairings is this console. I painted the screen Caliban green and the buttons red or yellow. The rim of the screen was gunmetal. The last step was to paint a crosshair on the screen with scorpion green, which was difficult and painful and I don't have the skill to paint and film that both well at the same time. So here's the aftershot. I also highlighted the buttons off camera. There were a few other sections that needed gunmetal too, namely these straps holding the red canisters in place. And now it was time to snap the lads off their handles and remove their painfully placed pins. And with a proportionate amount of superglue, I sat them in their anti-grav sun lounges. While that dried, I turned my attention to the multi-melter, the end of which was yellow. I made a glaze using an old paint called Fiery Orange, and glazed about half of this part with that. Once dried, I glazed the end quarter with the same colour, 
but the combination of the two made it such that it was getting more orange further away from the tip. And now it was time to glue on the fairings. You may notice the bolt pistol arm of the pilot has moved, because it wouldn't fit in this way. But since I pinned it, it was easy to solve, and no touch-up jobs were required. Just adding the last fairing, the one with the heavy flamer. I added this decal to the leg off camera, from these ancient transfer sheets I found. On the top fin, I didn't exactly copy the reference picture here, but mine do the job. I added a small ultramarine symbol on the right side, and the squad number 7 on the left. And now for the base. A poll on Instagram swung heavily in favour of Goblin Green, rather than leaving it black or something else. A green undercoat, sand on top, another coat of green, and a dry brush of dark sand. And there we have it, one mostly metal Ultramarine Slant Speeder. 241 grams of anti-grav support, manned by two ambitious assault marines, putting in the overtime. Painted in the mid-90s heavy metal style, oh that was the plan anyway, I tried my best, but I'm pleased with the results. I enjoyed this project immensely, discovering all the details and painting them as sharply as I could. So this adorable model now joins its comrades from a crag, as part of my retro Ultramarines army. I hope one day to get some more second edition games in with these, or to be honest, I would be happy to play third edition again, or even one page rules. Maybe one day I will field them all, and it will be glorious day worthy of tale and song. A shame I'm struggling to think of one of those. So. It's been nice to take a break from chaos and paint some more of my darling ultramarines again. But the next video will doubtless be chaos once more. Yet I'm not finished with the ultramarines. I still have another predator planned for example, and you never know what projects I might get inspiration for. I do collect ultramarines in Primaris and Horus Heresy as well, so it's nice to have them from a range of eras. Anyway, if you like what I do, why not check out my Instagram? And with that, I had better go paint some more minis. Take care, and thanks for watching. So if you're still watching at this stage, you'll probably be one of those who likes the songs that I do. And if you don't like them, then consider this to you notice served. And I will say, the tune I've chosen is a familiar one, but it works. And as a wise man once said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Two, three, four. Land speeder, speeder of land. Multi melter, speeder of land. Heavy flamer, speeder of land. Flimsy armor, speeder of land. Fast skimmer, speeder of land, and it's called a land speeder because it was found by arc and speed. I mean land, land speeder, speeder of land. Land speeder, speeder of land, yeah. Take care, and thanks for watching.